Welcome everybody to the uh, Calhort Society meeting. I just wanted to give a, um, another plug for the seed exchange you have till the end of the month. So another uh, couple of days in order to um, participate in getting some fabulous seeds. Evan has joined us. Bart, do you want to introduce Evan? Yes, Evan moved to California, I believe in either um, late 2012 or early 2013. I think it was 12 um, and was <clears throat> working at then Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. Uh, he was the uh, seed collection person uh, there for um, a number of years. Uh, then when he spoke to us last, he was um, the um, assistant director of the Mildred Mathias Botanic Garden at UCLA. <clears throat> and uh, now, uh, and I believe when he spoke to us, it was right before he was starting his new position as executive director of Theodore Payne Foundation in Sunland uh, in LA. As many of you may know, uh, Theodore Payne Foundation for uh, California wildflowers and native plants uh, has been around since the 1960s. Um, they own a parcel of land up in Latuna Canyon. Uh, it's it's gone through many changes. They got a huge grant uh, a short number of years ago that really transformed the organization. And Evan's been, uh, came to it right as the pandemic started. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be interesting things about that as well. But um, Evan has been uh, not only a seed collector, plant collector, grower, he also had uh, worked at the Arnold Arboretum uh, in Boston. Um, and again, has, a, oh, I guess one thing to mention, uh, he also is part of a uh, music group. Um, <laughs> and, and sometimes does performances so uh, public performances. So anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Evan. And again, good to see you. And thank you for speaking to us again this evening about TPF. Thank you, Bart. And thanks everybody for uh, having me tonight. It's nice to be here. The band is called Sage Against the Machine. Uh, I was actually formed early in those California Botanic Garden years. Um, and, and Bart, I think, I don't know if you know this, that part of the lore of Sage Against the Machine, um, which started as a collaboration between Antonio Sanchez, who's a, a nursery grower down here in Southern California, pretty, pretty famous in the native plant world down here. He and I started playing music the night of Bart's going away party from California Botanic Garden when, when Bart took the position as, um, as the director at Tilden, there was a party and I was, I, back in those days, would play kind of cocktail lounge jazz for some of the parties. Uh, Lucinda McDade, the director, would always get me to, to do that. And then Antonio just jumped on the mic and started freestyling a song about Bart leaving, which was our first song that we ever played. So Bart, you're part of the, you're part of the lore of Sage Against the Machine. Um, and we actually just recorded an album, which, which we're going to hopefully release soon. We, we just played the Oxnard Native Plant Festival. So uh, it's a lot of fun. We've been doing it for almost 10 years now, which is crazy. But um, we've really got a full six an album. Man. We have an album coming out, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> pretty fun. I had um, no idea. Yeah, it's, it's, we've actually gotten pretty serious about it in the last few years. We've done, we played at um, Los Angeles State Historic Park, which was really cool. We had like a view of downtown while we were playing. And um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So check us out. We're on Instagram. It's at Native Stage Against the Machine. Um, and so thank you guys for having me today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I will be perfectly honest that I'm, we just got off our big, um, busy winter plant sale and spring is always very frenetic. So this presentation is going to be slightly loose. I was up to the last minute pulling the slides together, um, for this. And I want to actually thank, um, uh, some, some of the staff here who, who allowed me to kind of take some of their presentations and, and Frankenstein them together into what you'll see tonight. So 
That was Tim Becker, who's our director of horticulture, Jenny Arnold, who is our seed um, program manager, and Aaron Johnson, who is our director of public programs. They all gave me their presentations and I quickly kind of pulled part bits and pieces to give you guys hopefully kind of a holistic view of Theodore Payne Foundation, what we do, why we think it's important, um, how it fits into the larger conversation of horticulture in California, um, and then how you can interact with it even if you don't live down here in Southern California. But I do hope you'll all visit and it's a good place to, uh, to come to visit as you'll see. Um, yeah, today we're gonna just kind of go over uh, a bunch of stuff about native plants and Theodore Payne and what we're doing. And um, as Bart said, I've been in this job since uh, the beginning of 2020. So it's been a really wild ride um, as it has been for, I think most of the, the nursery world and the, and the plant world in that we went through this sort of existential, very scary moment of, um, of the pandemic hitting and, you know, Theodore Payne is, is an organization that doesn't rely on a big endowment. We're, we're very much earned income each year. So very scary when the pandemic started. Um, and then it quickly pivoted to just trying to keep up with the demand because plants have gone crazy over the last two years. So it's been um, a period of a lot of change, a lot of growth, a lot of adapting to new ways of communicating, new ways of, um, of running a nursery and running a nonprofit. So it's been really exciting. It's been stressful. Um, and I'll try to share some of the stuff that's happened before I was here and some of the stuff to stop me, throw your questions in the chat and um, and we'll just kind of be, you know, just go through it tonight. So we're starting with a Humboldt lily, um, but I actually want to start with an overview, let's see, okay. With, with actually a land acknowledgement. And this is something that we take very seriously at Theodore Payne is respecting the indigenous community and particularly being in the native plant world. Um, we feel like it's very important to um, work hand in hand with the indigenous community and to honor their knowledge. So I want to start by acknowledging that Theodore Payne Foundation, we sit on the traditional village of Wikonga, the ancestral homeland of the uh, Wikambitam, who are now known as the Fernandinho Tatavium Band of Mission Indians. And we acknowledge our neighbors, the Tongva, Chumash, Tatavium, Katanamuk, and Serrano, the original stewards of what is now Los Angeles County. We are committed to uplifting the names of these lands and commu community members from the over 200 California First Nations who reside alongside us, and we honor their traditional ecological knowledge. And we had some really wonderful partnerships in the last few years with the indigenous community um, that I won't go in too deeply into um, tonight, but just to, just to add that point that it's something that we really value here. Um, so you're seeing an overview of LA in this first um, photo and it's pretty stark, right? It's, it's the San Gabriel Mountains and the San, Santa Monica Mountains, and then a whole lot of concrete and a whole lot of sprawl. And that's uh, probably what you all think of us up there in Northern California, that we just live in a land of concrete down here. Um, but it's not totally true as I'll show you in a minute. But before we get in, hone in on LA, which is really where our work is focused and in Southern California in general, I wanna just start with this sort of obligatory slide that you've probably all seen before and you're aware of, but this is just showing you how unique California is as an ecological part of the United States. So you're seeing basically a, a, um, a map that shares the, the uh, density of endemic species. So the blue is the highest density of species which are endemic, which means species which only occur in a certain place. So there's, there's no place more biodiverse than California um, in the United States, and there's no place that's more unique from the rest of the United States as California. So really important um, from a ecological and botanical perspective, um, as everywhere is, but particularly in California here, we just have a super high diversity of plants, which makes it really fun to work with native plants here because there's a lot to, to choose from. Um, we're, we're a biodiversity hotspot. And this is kind of an interesting one. This is the California floristic province you're seeing here. I remember Bart talking about this uh, some number of years ago and he went, I don't know what, if that still is, is the current thinking Bart, but redrawing re this line. But this is showing you what is considered to be this unique region of California. Um, 
and, and of the world. It's a sort of a unique um, floristic community, floristic province that is the Mediterranean um, part of North America, which has a really unique flora. So we're in a biodiversity hotspot. We're in the most biodiverse state in the country. Um, incredible things that only occur here. But what we're seeing in a lot of landscapes is this. Um, pretty much unchecked urbanization and sprawl that's been going on for many years. Um, but in actually many years, in some ways, but in other ways, compared to other parts of the world, it's relatively short. And here in Southern California, many of us, you know, many of these landscapes were relatively wild. Um, 100, 150 years ago, they may have been grazed and disturbed, but they certainly weren't paved over the way they are now. So when you compare California to other parts of the world, um, you just, you have this really unique intersection of rapid, relatively recent rapid development, um, a huge amount of ecological change and disturbance, a whole sh major shifting of water to totally change the ornamental landscape uh, or to, to create an ornamental landscape that had very little resemblance to the original um, landscape. And that's what we're dealing with. Um, but one of the misnomers that I always kind of hone in on is this idea that it's that LA is just pure sprawl. Um, if you see, there's actually quite a bit of green, even in even in this large kind of disturbed landscape. Um, but what that green is really matters, right? And we're all gardeners here, and so we know that you know not each plant uh, is created equally. You probably are most likely to see this if you were just to zoom in onto any of those little green bits on that aerial image I just showed you. You're going to see lawns. You're going to see some shrubs. You're going to see some trees. You're going to see some palms. You might see some yuccas. Um, you're, but you're going to see a relatively non-native flora um, in general, and, and often not a, uh, not a, not a, something that is sustaining a whole lot of wildlife. Particularly this lawn. You know, this is this is pretty sterile. And so, there's been a movement for many years, and I think many of you have been involved in this movement to shift that and to go from landscapes like that to landscapes like this, where you will uh, see plants that can sustain um, habitat. And that's really my major focus is, is on. This is California buckwheat, super common plant, um, but one that you know is easy to overlook because it's not some rare, unusual collector's item. I think it's personally gorgeous and it flowers at a wonderful time of year and it's tough as nails and um, and you can shape it really hard and you can do all sorts of things to it. So I think it's a great garden plant, um, but it's actually less important what I think about it than what other organisms think about it. So you see all these beautiful and unusual animals that live um, that live on this plant and need this plant to survive. And I have all their names <laughs> in the notes. I don't know, know them off the top of my head, but um, this is a, a somewhat common thing when you when you um, plant native plants is you're going to be attracting um, native pollinators and native insects. And with that, you're restoring a food chain, um, restoring the trophic levels, giving more food to birds, um, and basically rebuilding an ecology that was lost and damaged after the colonial um, era in California when the landscape was completely changed. So the plants that we'll be talking about tonight, California native plants, we often talk about them because of their adaptation to the California climate. But what gets me a lot more excited is their ability to, um, to help mitigate the biodiversity crisis that we're in, the extinction crisis that we're in. Um, so I think there's we're at this moment in, in history, and we've, we've been in it for a long time, but it's becoming more acute every day, that we really need to make some new decisions um, environmentally, or we're in serious danger. And not only we're in serious danger, but a whole lot of animals uh, and ecosystems are in serious danger. And this is just a, a ready-made solution that's right at our fingertips right now. It's just choosing different plants. 
so we're going to kind of get the you know paint the picture of what that might look like before I really get into things and um, what, what you're seeing here are the areas that we really focus on at Theodore Payne, which are the sort of interstitial edges of, of urban, the urban Southern California um, deep into the deep core. So we think that, you know, we, we jump back to that, you know, go back to that image in your mind of the mountains with the sprawl that I started with. Those mountains are relatively intact wild ecosystems still. And then there are sort of fingers of native habitats that reach into the urban core. And then you go into this dense urban situation, which is totally different. So we try to understand all those different um, gradients of nature through deep wild nature into the fully urban landscapes of LA and, and think about them. And think about how we can utilize those spaces differently to sustain life. So you might have areas like this, um, these hills here with a view of downtown in the background. You might have someone's yard where you could plant things like Toyon. You might have more sort of designed spaces, such as this one where you're seeing um, you're seeing some native sages and it looks like buckwheat there. Um, or places like this where you have a hedge of uh, lemonade berry. Because all of these things are going to be, all these plant choices really can sustain life in ways that non-native plants can't. So you, you know, just a, a couple other examples. We have a mining bee on a, a mallow. We have the yucca moth, which needs the chaparral, yucca, hespera yucca whippoli to, to survive. Um, we have different butterflies, um, birds. These are all things that are, it's very important to have, um, to create habitat in the urban environment that will sustain them. And all of these photos are taken in the urban environment. So plant choice is super important when it comes to ecological interaction. A couple more images just to sort of set the mood here of, um, of nature in the city and what it can look like. Because there are good examples of this now. I don't want to go through this with the sort of doom and gloom perspective that everything is, is bad. There are people doing amazing work right now, as you'll see. There's just a lot more of it to do from, from my pers uh, perspective. And then you you get into areas where they're you know even in even in sort of the most quote unquote destroyed landscapes you'll still see nature winning. And I was I was um, I'm amused when I see this heterotheca, which will grow in highly disturbed urban areas and native species. Uh, but you can see you know what how much loss of habitat has occurred, seeing it like playing out. Um, but knowing that with the right intention, it's it's pretty easy to rebuild habitat, um, as I'll get into in a minute here. And these plants are so resilient, they will arrive in the most um, broken down industrial parts of Southern California. And, and it's not all the plants, but some that you see consistently are ones like this, um, Datura radii, Jimson weed, which will grow in highly urbanized areas, including my neighborhood in Van Nuys, where it grows in median strips and you'll find it almost everywhere. And then that beautiful California buckwheat that I started the presentation with is actually a pretty tenacious urban plant. Here it is growing out of um, concrete. But this is few and far between. You know, when you when we the changes that we've made to the landscape uh, don't really allow for much thriving of ecology. And so our goal as an organization is to hit from as many angles as we can hit this idea that, hey, we can really shift the future of biodiversity, the future of ecology, the future of these unique endemic species of California by landscaping, gardening, and horticulture. And it's amazing to me that often that idea hasn't, um, hasn't kind of entered the public zeitgeist. You know, they, everyone thinks of plants and gardens in a certain way. They don't think of them as this is the environment. This is, th these plants literally are the environment. And so you can choose to have an environment that is um, diverse and sustaining of life, or you can choose to not have one. So that's our goal as an organization. And we work very hard to do that, um, basically to bring native plants into the local urban environment, Southern California. 
And what I, I like to summarize this um, in a couple of terms that um, sit up that are out there and I think are, are very important to think of. One is the idea of ecological horticulture, which is the idea that the sort of guiding principle of your horticultural decisions, rather than being say aesthetic, which is not a common one, rather than being curatorial, which is another one, you know, people want to curate a collection of rare things, rather than being functional, you want it super low maintenance, um, that your guiding principle, and, it, and you can have an element of all those principles in it, but the real guiding principle would be ecological. I want to have ecology in my garden. I want it to be an ecosystem. I want to sustain life with this space. And that is the most important principle to me. It doesn't mean you can't have other principles. It doesn't mean you can't still be a curator and have 50 species of, um, of bulb. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't be thinking from a maintenance perspective and say, I, I don't want it to be high maintenance or, or from a sustain, sustainability perspective. Um, but I do hope that in years to come, this sort of way of organizing the principle behind what you're doing in your garden starts to catch on. The idea that ecology is really important and should actually be a guiding principle and how you think about your garden and what you do in it. And then the other idea that kind of plays in with that is the idea of distributed restoration, meaning that, and this is one that I'm curious, I know there's a lot of people here who, who are very smart and probably thought about this a lot. Sometimes I say this and people are like, ah, like, the idea that the, the individuals can help to restore the ecosystem by garden choices. And I, I fully believe that that's true and stand by that. And I'll talk in a second about how we really try to give tools to make that um, be a possibility. But essentially this is the idea that, um, that if e each of us collectively and individually um, work together to, rest to restore little patches of habitat wherever we can, that that strengthens and strengthens and strengthens to the point where we're actually restoring something on a massive scale uh, on, on a scale that will be significant for the long-term viability and health of the ecosystem. Okay, so that's some of my, my background where I'm coming from. That's my pitch to you um, to, to think about. And I'm going to sort of try to now go into some of the the nitty gritty of how we as an organization at Theodore Payne Foundation work on that problem and work on convincing people to uh, to think that way. If anyone has any questions, by the way, feel free to just throw them out. I'm, I'm totally happy to kind of stop and um, take my time and answer any questions as we go. So Theodore Payne Foundation acronym is TPF. You're going to hear me say that a bunch. When I say TPF, it means Theodore Payne Foundation. First question you probably have is why are we named Theodore Payne Foundation? The answer is uh, a man named Theodore Payne who came from um, England in the, in the 18, late 1800s and lived here for the rest of his life and, and lived in Los Angeles. Opened his first plant shop in I believe 1902 in downtown. Um, he was not contrary to popular belief only a native plant horticulturist. He actually started out growing lots of plants from all over the world. And as he developed in his career, um, honed in more and more on natives until that was basically his main passion and purpose in life. And he um, added many new plants into the or ornamental horticultural industry that hadn't been previously um, part of that industry. And just did a whole lot to promote native plants um, in Southern California. He passed away in 1863, which was uh, 1963, which was three years after the foundation formed. So, the foundation is an independent 501c3 nonprofit that Theodore Payne, the man, never had a whole. I mean, he he was involved in it setting up, um, but for the course of most of its life as an organization, um, he'd already passed. But we like to say because he opened his nursery in 1901, we're almost 120 years old as a sort of con continuous entity. And as this existing 501c3, uh, we're now at 62 years, which is which is really great. And it's grown a lot in those 62 years. There's the original shop. Um, Theodore Payne Nurseryman and Seedsman. Um, and you can see if you're, you know, those of you who are 
your kind of taxonomic folks, you're gonna see that those, these are not native plants here, most in, in the front. Um, he didn't only do native plants, um, but he started to hone in on that. So it's not all or none for me. And I, I think for many horticulturists, native plants are really important, but it doesn't mean because you like native plants, you can't like something else. And because you like something else, you can't like native plants. My perspective on it is that you should just try to have some native plants in your garden, no matter what. And I think Theodore Payne would agree. So what do we do now? Well, um, as an organization, we really try to break down all of these things that I was talking about and having, you know, changing and moving things um, in three primary ways. Um, so so our, our biggest programs here are our horticulture program. And we are, at the end of the day, a horticultural organization. Um, in, in, I've worked at a number of places and have been very allied with sort of the academic side of botanical gardens and the research side. We're much more purely horticultural and, and um, purely trying to influence the, the nursery industry and the horticultural industry and the way that people garden. So it's, it's really about home gardening um, and shifting the perception so that we can have big public shifts in the way that that's happened. And it's nice to have that specific fo focus because it allows us to be very targeted in what we do and, and to, um, to really work in the public space and work at sort of the grassroots level for affecting change throughout in this industry. So we'll kind of go through each of these programs in a little more detail. We have our retail horticultural side, we have our conservation side, um, and then this more sort of ornamental side where we work um, with development to, uh, to create native plant gardens uh, throughout Southern California. Our other major program is our educational um, work. And that again is very horticulturally focused. We do have some classes in um, botany and ecology and um, sort of naturalist type classes, but the, the majority of our educational offerings are in horticulture. So how to grow plants, how to maintain them, um, how to propagate, how to design, all the things that you would need to be successful at actual gardening. So again, very horticultural. We work in a number of sort of spaces in the education world, um, including kind of lay public homeowners who are looking for sort of informal education to um, professionals who are, you know, very good at what they do and they're just trying to add new skills um, to K, K through 12 university classes and, and all, all sorts of other things as well. And then the final one, which we spend a lot of time on is outreach um, and to and just sort of getting this idea out in new ways, engaging new audiences and trying to get people excited about uh, what we're talking about. And um, as we go through a lot of these things, I, I think will be accessible or um, available to you, Northern California dwellers. Um, so, so you know, there, there's ways to interact with us outside of just uh, being here at a physical site. But I do want to start with where we are located. Spark mentioned we're in a place called Sun Valley, which is a neighborhood of Los Angeles, just north of the of Burbank. If you know where Burbank is, it is a neighborhood of LA. It doesn't feel like it. It's very remote. It's in a canyon. Um, it's right at the edge of the sort of sprawl of Los Angeles. And we have 22 acres uh, of property, which includes display gardens like this one you're seeing here. We have a beautiful penstemon, spectacular showy penstemon with the Palo Verde in the background. Um, so we have quite a, quite a bit of display gardens on the site. We also have uh, natural areas. And we have a large nursery, which I'll talk more about in a sec. It's nice to have natural areas on site. We have a coastal sage scrub habitat. We have um, wild populations of Calicordis plumeray. We have um, just a, just a, you know beautiful some beautiful oak, um, coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, and kind of your typical inland coastal sage scrub of Artemisia californica, Melasma lorina, Salvia mellifera. Um, and it's nice to have that because we can talk about wildlands. We can talk about gardens. We can actually take people up to this one vista on the property, which I wanted to put an image in here, but I, I didn't get there in time. And we can show them, here's wild habitat. Here's a garden that you're standing next to. And then look down and you're seeing um, 
the San Fernando Valley and the urban sprawl, and we can spell out this idea that I've been talking about, which is if we pick different plants, plants have different plant choices, we can connect different ecological zones within Los Angeles to restore biodiversity, to restore habitat, to create um, connectivity from one mountain range to another. And that's a, a really neat thing to be able to sort of explore those different um, layers of, of land stewardship and, and um, things that are being done on the landscape. So we're very lucky to have that. And we're also lucky now to be taking it sort of to our next level, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're deep in the process of working through a land landscape master plan with a landscape architecture firm called Terramoto, who does absolutely beautiful work. I'm very excited about this. Um, that should be completed this year. And it's basically a, a very holistic view of our whole 22 acre property. We'll be um, creating a whole bunch of new paths, um, new gardens, and just sort of reconfiguring a lot of stuff to make it really a, a, a premier destination for not only uh, native plant horticulture, but we want to make it so it's just horticulture in general. Theodore Payne will be um, a garden, you know, a world-class garden that also happens to be a native plant garden with a very specific theme and message, but it's exciting to be working on that. And um, I think that'll be very beautiful. So the landscape is worth coming down and visiting just to see, but we do a lot of other things in horticulture. One of our pro um, programs that is most active is our seed program. Everything starts with seeds. We have a, we maintain a collection that has over 700 species of, uh, of plants, everything from kind of obscure annuals to shrubs. Um, we have a very large bulb program. I know you guys were mentioning bulbs before. One of the things on our master plan that we're excited about is a, we'll actually be building um, this spring is a new bulb, bulb house, so 1800 square foot space that will, a good portion of the space will be devoted to growing um, bulbs. There, you know, as, as bulb um, purveyors have become less common, we want to both make bulbs available to the retail market, but also utilize that space to do more conservation oriented growing of rare species, uh, including bulbs, but also other, other rare um, types of plants. We get to kind of celebrate our historical roots. This is Theodore Payne's own seed scale. I have no idea how old it is, but sort of a cherished artifact for us that gets everyday use. And I just do a little story. Um, this is something that kind of shows what we focus on and what we do and the way we try to think about plants. So you probably, or most of you are familiar with this plant, um, blue-eyed grass, uh, Cicerinchium bellum. And it's, a, it's not a rare plant by any means, but um, we try to, we, we really think sort of in terms of what we do from both a scientific place, but also a symbolic place. And so this is maybe a little symbolic and, and scientific as well, but this was a population of um, blue-eyed grass in Griffith Park. And if you know Griffith Park, it's a very urban park, um, still has some pretty intact plants, but a lot of it, um, is being lost by encroachment of development and just the things that come with that, like invasive species and just sort of decline in overall habitat health. So when we found this population, or Jenny found this population, was very excited that we could start to cultivate our own lineage of blue-eyed grass directly from Griffith Park. And so that's what she did. And that's kind of the, the nice thing to having the seed programs. We can actually go in, sustainably harvest a small amount of seeds, and then get those plants in production and track them pr through production so that we can um, kind of really rewild air, um, Southern California with these remnant little patches of habitat go into them and just sort of amplify and boost and that was in one of the earliest pieces of writing about the, about what Theodore Payne wanted the foundation to do was to, um, to kind of amplify the California flora and so we're it's cool to be able to carry that on. Here's what it looked like at the next step as we bring it back to our seed lab. We have uh, the seed blower, which I'm very familiar with from my California Botanic Garden days and seed sieves and separate the seed from the chaff. Um, and so we're working 
doing this type of work both in wildlands of collecting and processing seed as well as in our own um, on our own property we do quite a bit of seed regeneration here's uh, I think that's a salvia carduacea if I'm not mistaken that we were it's probably a specific population that we're regenerating and we do this for all sorts of stuff um, we had a big pro project with fire followers a few years ago which was really cool things like Facilia grandiflora which is beautiful Facilia typically only comes up after wildfires um, but that's some of the work we do in our seed bank and it's also very tapped into the whole nursery and production cycle which is kind of cool to be able to have that holistic interconnected um, setup as a nursery and as a as well as a horticultural and conservation oriented um, growing team so we do have a propagation nursery and we produce um, somewhere in the range of, of 75 to 80,000 plants a year. So it's, uh, it's four full-time folks working on it. We're about to open our second site actually, which is exciting and, and nerve wracking as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a production site in Debs Park in Northeast LA. And that will be, um, that will be in collaboration with the Audubon Society, which is pretty cool and, and we're excited about it. And we'll be growing at that space exclusively um, local plants for kind of urban land restoration, both in larger projects, as well as people who want to buy those locally produced, um, locally sourced plants for their own, uh, creating habitat in their own spaces. So we're really excited about getting that going. That's, we're working on that right now. Then the way that a lot of people interact with us currently is, is through our retail nursery, which as I mentioned, has been booming. Um, it's, it's a good problem, but it's something happening throughout the entire native plant world right now. And I think the entire nursery industry is, the demand is massive. And we're seeing something like 30% increases basically a year since I've started year on year, with just huge increases in demand. Um, things getting sold out all the time. Um, so it's an interesting time to be in the native plant world because right now we're in this, 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 this era of trying to bring it into the mainstream to some extent, which means the, the big focus is on stabilizing production, stabilizing um, consistency with crops. And we're not there yet, honestly, you know, like getting hummingbird sage in Southern California right now is like, damn near impossible, or if it's available, it's going to be gone within one day. So there still are um, shortages, but I think it's come a very long way, even in the 10 years that I've really been involved in it here, um, to see it going from something where there was a one once a year plant sale at a few places, and, and it was that was kind of the big release of native plants each year to there's a lot of, now there's a lot of nurseries that are selling native plants every day. There still is, um, some issues with supply chain and consistency, but we're working on that and getting better at it every year. And it's been very exciting to see uh, the growth and demand. And with our nursery, because as being a nonprofit, we don't just sell plants for the, the heck of it. We only sell native plants and we really focus heavily on um, sharing information as we, as we get plants out to the public. So someone was just talking about milkweed on the chat, I saw. Um, and uh, here, here's the narrow leaf milkweed. So we'll have, you know, quite a bit of information focused primarily on horticultural um, knowledge. As I said, that's our main focus is giving people the tools to be successful at growing plants. Um, we have this icon system so that, you know, you, you would know that if you see clay and you have clay soil, you can get away with growing this one. You know that it's gonna support butterflies here, you know, it's local. Um, so all that informational, work is really, really important to, to what we do in our retail nursery. And then we do some really interesting things in, in retail that I'm excited to work on, I'm excited to sort of boost over the next few years. One of is our local source program, which has been going on for quite a while, but basically uh, um, we, this is our purple tag program and uh, we call it our local source. And what it does is it gives, um, home gardeners, the ability to purchase plants that have provenance. So provenance meaning, you know, with the plant comes an attached bit of information telling you 
where the plant came from, telling you something about its origin. That's typically not done in the nursery world. Plants are just sort of treated as interchangeable and any, you know, do you get a, um, if you get a yarrow, it's just a yarrow. But obviously we know that's not really true. And me, my background in botanical gardens, you know, I, I've always been a curator and, and thought from a curatorial, curatorial mindset. So it's really nice to have a sort of market-based product, a retail product that gives a home gardener that ability to be a curator. Um, and this is, so here's a salvia mellifera, black sage that came from the Verdugo Mountains. So if you happen to live uh, in Kegel Canyon or in La Tuna Canyon or anywhere here, um, right, right around where I'm, you know, right Sun Valley where I am right now, you'd be in the Verdugo Mountains. So you could buy this plant planted in your garden and really be matching the ecology, the phenology, all those features as closely as possible. Um, so it's exciting to have that. And I think it also adds a bit of sort of interesting symbolic component to purchasing that plant because you're buying a plant that um, you know where it came from. When you put it back in the ground, you, um, you really are getting to participate in this restoration of, of the land. Um, so we, I know that uh, folks wanted me to talk a little bit about, um, about what we offer to, to Northern California. So one is that we have an online store. This is a new pandemic pivot. We had a, a small online store, but that's ramped up. It's, that's actually grown some insane amount, like 700% in the last two years. And so that's been really interesting to scale that up. It's become a really big source of our business. Um, but we sell everything we have through our online store. We ship basically everything except for plants. So I, I hate to say that if you wanna buy plants, you'll have to drive to Sun Valley to pick them up. You can buy them online and come here and pick them up, but we don't ship plants, but we ship everything else, including our seeds. Um, so all the seeds you can purchase and we'll ship. Um, we, at any given time, it, it, the, it, it, things change, but I just looked and we have something like 350 different types of seeds up right now, including a lot of things that are pretty hard to find. Um, we make our own custom mixes. We also have a lot of kind of neat clothes. This is just a fun thing. And this gets into that idea of, um, of sharing native plants and boosting the signal and boosting the message. This is our director of operations, Andrew Chavez, who would be horrified if he knew that I put a photo of him in this presentation, but he chose to model this new shirt. This was kind of fun. Just tie, you know, tying into who we are as an organization. Um, this was an old, uh, early, I think, 1960s brochure about California native plants desirable for gardens and bird sanctuaries. And we thought it was just so charming. The text said, shrubs which bear attractive fruit relished by many birds. And it lists the birds, lists each plant, and then goes through in this very sort of old-timey, quaint um, writing about each plant. And so we just basically scanned the, the brochure and made a shirt out of it. The one change that we made was we corrected all the scientific names. So they're in the modern Jepson, uh, you know, the most uh, current um, taxonomic nomenclature, which was, so we get, we get to be nerdy and kind of explore that and, that, and that's kind of fun. Um, we have all kinds of good clothes, for, like gifts and stuff. Um, you know, if you're looking for native plant themed stuff for the holidays, cool shirts, of course, we have to have masks uh, given the pandemic. But the thing that I think uh, is really neat that we have is we have a bookstore. It's quite small, but it's really curated. And it's a lot of things you expect like plant guides and um, horticultural information, design books. But we also get into things that we just think are important as part of, sort of the overall philosophy of being of thinking about your garden as, as an environmental act, think about gardening as an environmental act. So we have books on um, water conservation, on land conservation, on indigenous practices and relationships with nature. Um, so if you're looking for just some kind of fun book recommendations, I do suggest going to our online store and checking that out. It's store.theodorepain.org, excuse me. That gets us through horticulture and the retail operation to um, education, which is a really big component of everything we do going through kind of weaves throughout everything. But in terms of our actual 
kind of day-to-day -day education, um, we offer a number of things. One is we do a, a number of classes. Uh, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but it's I think it's over, it's over 100 classes a year. And some of them are, are just kind of one-off lectures. Some of them are um, four to six part courses, primarily horticulturally focused. Um, we have a really nice design series. We're doing a series right now about a six part kind of gardening series to get folks just very much thinking like a gardener. Um, beginner classes, fun things and, and obscure things. Um, and many of those are online. So you can take those from anywhere. And we do get a number of Northern California folks um, taking our classes. So just check that out. If you go on our homepage, you can get to any of the things I'm talking about. That's all linked there. And those are for, um, for the general public. Anyone can, can sign up for those classes. One of the biggest um, gaps we've seen in the mission that we're trying to achieve being effective is the lack of professional knowledge on how to work with and maintain native plant landscapes. It's something that um, is different. I mean, it's not it's not hard in my perspective. Uh, you know, native plant gardening is is actually quite can be fairly easy depending on if you do it right. Um, but it's much different than what your average California landscaper knows how to do or is used to doing. So we've identified that and over the last uh, decade with the, our partners, California Native Plant Society and a bunch of experts throughout the state, probably including some folks uh, who are watching me right now, we developed this curriculum that, um, that has uh, 20 hours of, of teaching, including eight, uh, eight two-hour classroom kind of courses and then two in-person practicums. Um, and that's been really neat to, to get that launch. That launched uh, during the pandemic. So it's been mostly done via Zoom um, with some in-person work, but we've had funding in place, which is wonderful through the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And we've now had over 300 people complete this course. Um, and it's really giving, you know, we're not expecting to give people the every, you know, it's, it's not an apprentice program, but it, it's 20 hours of direct teaching that gets all the fundamentals of, you know, that are important to know. So we really hope that this can start to shift um, the, the landscape industry towards being comfortable with these plants and then seeing more success in installations, home installations, as well as municipal installations of native plant and ecological landscapes so that that will sort of prime the pump and allow that work to continue over time. Um, like I already mentioned all this, here's one of our happy classes graduating. We do half of the classes in Spanish, half in English. Landscape industry being, uh, having a lot of Spanish speaking frontline workers, we thought it was really important to offer it in Spanish. This is Alejandro Lemus, who's our uh, assistant nursery manager, and he teaches our Spanish classes. So it's all taught by folks who really have great experience. And it's been really awesome to see the kind of community building uh, in this program that's happening. The, the classes we have, everything from native plant ID, soil management, irrigation, rebates, which is really important, weeding, IPM, pruning, um, and then we get into the business aspects. So the garden assessment and pricing and scheduling. And then there's also some marketing. How do you market to your clientele that you have this special skill, you know, that you are, know how to work with native plants, that you maybe are, you know, ecologically or sustainably minded? Because that's actually quite an, an, a unique thing to have. So um, what's really nice about this program is that it gives that horticultural knowledge that, they, that folks would need to be successful, but it also starts to, um, to reframe how people think of themselves as landscapers and think about what their impact can be and how they can market themselves. And so in that way, we hope that it'll actually end up with people who complete it, getting paid more, advancing in their careers, and there's a, kind of a social justice component, um, job, job development, and um, building a community up to, to uh, hopefully make more money and, and uh, you know, be able to uh, 
the live easier lives. Um, that, that's one of the goals as well. So it's, it's not only about the plants, it's about the community of landscapers as well. So as I mentioned, we've uh, had about 300 certificates awarded so far. We've got over a thousand people interested in taking it, which is really great. We've been funded for a second year now. And you'll start to see in Southern California, these on uh, trucks, these are decals on websites. It's really exciting to see that going out into the world um, in the last two years since we've launched it, just it's becoming something that exists, which is really nice um, uh, that people are starting to identify particularly as we're heading into another cycle of drought that you know, we think it's really important that we get some organization towards training and um, making sure that this round of drought, people make good choices as opposed to AstroTurf or gravel and agave landscapes will actually get beautiful Mediterranean ecologically sustainable landscapes. One other um, thing that we're working on right now, we're about to launch in the next month is this professional education portal, which we're really excited about. Um, this, this will hold all of our professional classes and um, it's been really complicated to build it, but it, it uh, gives us all the infrastructure that like an extension school would have so we can disseminate homework. We can put all of our Zoom links in one place. Um, we, there's forums to interact with the teacher. And so that's really exciting to just be able to start to grow a professional um, education portal. But one of the things that we've kind of tacked on last minute that I'm most excited about, I'm really curious to see how this plays out, is a job board um, for landscapers that homeowners can actually enter um, their home in. This is one of the biggest gaps we've seen in, in the nursery is people always ask us, I, I really want to do a native plant garden, but I can't find a good landscaper to do it. And we have a list of people and there are some out there, but there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, there's, there's, they're few and far between and they're hard to find and they're overbooked. So uh, they could be very expensive if they're good. So the goal here is that, you know, as, as things start to gain steam, a homeowner could say, I have a project in Echo Park. Um, it's a thousand square feet. I'm looking for someone to do a drought tolerant landscape. And we don't know that that ever existing before in a in sort of a clearinghouse for native plant and ecological gardening. So I'm curious to see how this gets utilized, um, but I think that could it could you know if it works, it'll be a really great step towards connecting this demand, which we know is out there, with a supply of native plant um, of skilled native plant landscaping, which can really help to make those shifts that I've been talking about this whole time. We also do a lot of consulting for. Um, for kind of urban projects. Um, here's a, we're doing a pollinator, we're, we're doing a kind of plant selection and plant brokering for a pollinator garden in downtown at a brewery actually, which is kind of fun because they always give us beer at the end of, uh, the end of our meetings. Um, but that's something that is also needed is, is um, horticultural expertise throughout the whole kind of construction process as e ecological landscapes and biodiversity is, and nature-based solutions is becoming much more trendy and vogue, um, more people want it. And so it's, we're trying to position um, ourselves and, and other allied people who we know are really our experts in how to utilize these plants and how to be successful with them so that um, it's not greenwashing, it's the real deal and the real serious horticultural depth and, and substance is going into um, these projects which are becoming much more prevalent than they, than they used to be. And the final component I'll talk about um, tonight is, is outreach, which is a huge and important thing that we do at Theodore Payne Foundation. As I mentioned, we really focus a lot at the grassroots level, and we try to focus broadly throughout Southern California and different communities. Um, so I'll be brief here. I could go really deeply into outreach because we do a lot of work in this space, but one of the most joyful things that we do is actually get out and plant plants with communities. Um, we've done, we do quite a bit of that. Sometimes we donate the plants. Sometimes we have external funders who will um, help offset the cost to us, but we, we really like to just get out into communities and find, identify people who are already interested and already have their own sort of structure for 
um, installing and maintaining plant landscapes around town and just get them get plants in the ground. Um, it's amazing the goodwill and camaraderie that you can build by just gardening with with people and going into different communities and gardening with people who speak a different language from you or from a different community from you who look different from you. It really is a healing thing to put a plant in the ground. And so that is one of the ways that we um, love to focus, love to work and done some great um, planting projects this, this season um, with our indigenous partners, both the Fernandinho Tatavium at their local park next to their headquarters, as well as the Tongva at, at their sacred spring site in Santa Monica. So always looking to do more of that work. Um, I personally love to get out there. I spend most of my days behind a desk now, but I used, I used to be, you know, getting my hands dirty every day. And now I'm, now I'm uh, working on spreadsheets and, you know, sending emails. So I, I always try to get to these planting events uh, as much as I can, but that's a lot of fun. But during the pandemic, um, we really had to shift in how we talk to people because in-person large events were, were very difficult to do or impossible to do, I should say. So I'm really proud of the way that we were able to pivot to, um, to using the internet um, over that time. And uh, particularly with things like our YouTube channel, which we start, we filmed a lot of video, YouTube videos, um, how, both how-to videos as well as our garden tour. Um, and every year we do a giant native plant garden tour and it's usually in person, but in 2020, we kind of pioneered the using Zoom to do a garden tour thing, which now is, seems to be done quite a bit, but I believe we were the first people to do it in California. And I have to give credit to Margaret Oakley and Philip Otto who were uh, coordinating the tour at that time. They, they came up with that idea and they, that was the first time I ever used Zoom actually was to do a garden tour. And we had like 40 gardens over the course of two days, zooming in for 20 minutes. It was, it was really fun and really cool. And then the year after that, we pivoted to um, a much higher production value version where we had eight gardens. We followed those gardens through the season. So we did a, a sp uh, winter footage, spring footage. Um, and we did the big uh, kind of event, which is a three-day event with all sorts of programming. Um, that occurred uh, in the spring. And then we went back in summer and recapped. And, and um, so there's a whole bunch of content. All of that is freely available on our YouTube channel. So if you really want to go down the Theodore Payne rabbit hole, um, you can go to Theodore Payne. It's just Theodore Payne on YouTube. And there are literally like 100 hours of, <laughs> of various garden tours and talks and content. There's tons of stuff up there. Um, so I do encourage you to, to check it out. Particularly, I'm really proud of what we did in this 2021 um, garden tour where we, we looked through the seasons and I think we were able to take kind of a unique um, lens of, walk, of seeing the gardens move through time. And there's a couple shots that we've made and someday we'll really cut this into a serious um, video, but we have a beautiful, amazing creative mind, um, Marie Gonzalez, who's our creative director and she does all of our kind of photography and shooting and web development. And so she went to these gardens and would shoot different panoramas through, through the season. So we actually have some shots where it literally shows like the camera's just sort of panning and it goes from winter, then it's spring, then it's summer. And you see how drastically these landscapes change. And it's really interesting. And, and uh, I, I loved it because to me as a gardener, I've always thought of gardening in like a, as a four dimensional kind of practice. You know, it's an art that you have to be thinking of. You have to be thinking of what's going to happen in the future. When I, when I, you know, I'm planting this and it's this size, but it's going to get a lot bigger. Or I'm cutting this bud here, and that's going to cause, you know, these other buds to to grow. And actually, to see that in video form was was really fun. And particularly in native plant landscapes, which do change so drastically um, from season to season. So I, if you have the time to spare, I recommend checking that out on YouTube. Um, and if you are willing to come down to, to LA this year, our Native Plant Garden Tour for 2022 is back in person. It's probably the most ambitious one, it, uh, not probably, it is the most ambitious one we've ever done. Just amazing, new, a whole lot of new gardens on the tour. 
Um, we have featured gardens. There's, we'll, we'll be doing a hybrid where there's in person. The, the event is in person, but there's a whole lot of extra content online as well. And then the guidebook we're doing is uh, really curated and polished, and I'm really excited to to get it out into the world. Um, it's been a lot of work, but I think it'll be really beautiful and really help to kind of share native plant gardening at, as a serious mainstream component of the horticultural world. Um, so please, if you're able to, you know, get the weekend down here, get a stay with family or friends, or just get a hotel. It's going to be a big party. We have an after party and I hope you can join us for that. Um, some of the other outreach work we do, um, one, one major thing that we've been focusing on, um, thanks to some funding from Southern California Edison uh, at, and just being an important um, piece of knowledge to get out into the world is thinking about wildfire in the context of plant choice and also from the context of ecological um, ecological uh, so how should I frame this, of not being destructive ecologically when um, thinking about wildfire safety. You know, this has been interesting as wildfire season in California is so intense these days. And you hear like Donald Trump and others talking about California, like wildlands management. Uh, and, and it's just, it's on the kind of the mind of people. Well, when you really dig into what is happening with plants and what the people are saying um, there's a lot of work to do and a lot of awareness to raise so our approach to all this wildflower wildfire um, work is to is to share first of all the fact that wildfire is part of many california ecosystems and it's a natural part of those ecosystems but that with the friction and the tension of people living in areas that are were burning historically that there are things that need to be done um, and can be done in a way that protect lives, protect property, um, but also don't destroy ecology. So it doesn't have to be all just huge concrete cutting down every single plant. And we have this beautiful wildflower manual here, wildfire manual um, that goes through all that in detail, which you can actually um, you can get online as a PDF. And that would be very applicable if any of you folks live um, live in the urban wild interface, even though it's Southern California focused, it's a lot of the stuff is gonna to relate to Northern California as well. And then just sort of a fun outreach thing we do every year, and this has been going on for many years is our wildflower hotline, which is just sort of a roundup of where to go see wildflowers in, in Southern California. You can actually call a phone number and it'll you'll hear a recording of where to go. You can go to this website, which will give you a PDF um, as well as a, uh, a little link to a, um, to an MP3 that you can listen to. And then for the first time this year, we're going to have it as a podcast too. So you can just go to this podcast and find out where to see the wildflowers. Um, and that starts March 12th. So if you have any plans for spring trips, um, think, think about checking out the wildflower hotline that read by a retired actor, Joe Spano, who has a beautiful voice and just makes it very fun and charming to listen to where where the blooms are on, on any given year. Not looking so good this year. Everybody hope that we get a miracle march, but in lieu of that, um, things are already starting down here and I think they're gonna go really quick if we don't get more rain. And just as we wrap up here, I wanna just give a huge shout out to our volunteers. We have over 250 volunteers who help uh, maintain TPF grounds. We have almost 3000 members who support the foundation financially. We have a wonderful group of donors who, who support us, our partners, um, many organizations that fund our work and, and work closely with us. And then I'd like to just shout out our staff who um, are very dedicated and we do a lot with a pretty small team. We're small but mighty. Um, and with that, I'll just, Thank you guys for having me tonight and invite you to come visit us uh, in person in Sun Valley or online at theaterofpain.org. Thank you, Evan. It's a wonderful uh, introduction to Theater Bain Foundation. Does anybody have any questions for Evan? I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about your interaction with nurseries 
um, and how receptive they are to the idea of making natives a, a larger component of their marketing and merchandising and, um, and helping you with the supply chain issues that you mentioned. And as a corollary to that, I'm also interested in knowing if you're involved in any of the outreach that goes on about uh, reducing or eliminating neonics in nursery plants. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, since I've started, we well, one thing we do do is we work with a lot of the smaller boutique nurseries in in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a, there's a, about three or four nurseries that are small kind of independent nurseries and they sell native plants. We wholesale to them occasionally. And then we're part of sort of a community of support. Um, and then we also work, we're, we're very tied in with the wholesale community in Southern California um, because we, we can't keep up. We don't have enough space to grow the amount of plants we need for our retail. So we do buy in some plants from places like Tree of Life or El Nativo, um, some of the, nurse, the big wholesaler nurseries down here. Getting into the box store uh, thing, which I think is kind of where you were asking. Um, we had a, a short-term sort of relationship with Armstrong. Um, it, it hasn't, we, I haven't spoken to them recently. They're interested. There's interest out there. I think one of the problems that arises is just the consistency of keeping the plants looking good. And, you know, th they might not be quite as easy to, blow up and get you know looking the way that you, you know when you walk into home depot and you see all these just overflowing plants natives aren't always like that um, or if they are they're grown by really skilled growers uh, who really know what they're doing um but i'm, I'm certainly interested in continuing to pursue it i know that um musa creek is the wholesale nursery um they have or i don't know if they still do but i think they do they have a relationship with anna Walt lumber where they have little kind of stands within anna Walt lumber um retail stations that sell native plants so it's nascent i would say it's it's a it's an interesting idea um i think people will pursue it more in the next few years um i i would like to delve a little more deeply into it um, but the the challenge for us is that we're not a pure wholesale you know, we don't wholesale so when, like with the armstrong relationship that we were working on they kind of just wanted us to wholesale plants to them. We, we didn't have the capacity to supply on that level. So, um, so I think there's, you know, there's things to, things to figure out there. And I think it, it could be a, a good logical partnership over time. Um, and, and if I was working in, in, a, in, you know, if I was like a plant buyer for a, a large retailer like that, I would be looking at this market because you look at, um, the next, you know, millennials and and the TikTokers or whatever they're called, the people younger than millennials, um, they love environmental issues. They're really serious about sustainability. They're really serious about the environment, and they also can kind of whiff out greenwashing really easily. So, I think it would be a smart business move for anyone selling plants in the next twenty years to to consider diversifying. Um, their native plant offerings, not only not only drought tolerant, which is already happening. I was just in Home Depot buying some other, you know, some other stuff. And I went uh, this morning actually and went and just checked out the plant selection. They have a whole big drought tolerant selection. No natives. I was curious if there were any natives. There's no natives in that selection, but um, but I I don't see why you couldn't have a save habitat pollinator marketing pitch in the way that drought tolerant is out there. And I think you'll, I'm sure you'll see that in the next 10 years. I would be really surprised if you didn't. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any um, questions for Evan? Other than just <laughs> thank you, Evan, for um, for the presentation. And um, I guess the <clears throat> one thing I would ask is that for your consulting stuff, when it's your staff, how are you making that work? That's a good question. <laughs> um, you mean in terms of their time or their? Um... Yeah, I mean, um, I know that when I've ever been involved with anything like that, there's always a huge demand and that you, you would need several 
people full time just to do it. Yeah. And and I'm not sure <clears throat> how you at TPF would make that economical. Well, I mean, we build we build for the hours, so we um, we I would say we pick and choose what we do, and and it has to be something that's aligned with. You know, it's not it's it's not it's not for homeowners. That that's one thing. So it's it's it wouldn't be. It's only particularly for like larger projects, and um, it's typically we bill for the consulting hours, and then we we handle the plant brokering. So we we kind of get a big plant sale as well as as covering our time to to work on the um, the consultation. But yeah, it is it is an interesting. It's a you know I'm trying to figure that out a little bit. Um, particularly when running a nursery is so demanding, you know, there's just so much work has to be done just to kind of keep it all going. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because I, I, I see the need for it. And like you said, you could, we could be doing it all the time. Um, but we, we really try to do it in ways that we think are either going to projects that are very public that, that could really use the support or to organizations that are really allied. And, and, you know, we want to make sure that they, can share this through their their work, um, but yeah, it's it's always a juggling. You know, we're always juggling a lot here, and um, and uh, we we very consciously stayed away from doing any consulting for homeowners because that would that would just go crazy. I think. Yep. <laughs> I, have a, fun, I have another you know? question. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I recently. Um, saw a presentation by a Bay Area um, native plant group uh, whose um, they was called the pollinator posse and they uh, the woman who was giving the presentation um, said that in order to truly achieve the desired impact of a native garden that you need to have at least 80 percent of the plants be native plants in your garden and I was wondering if that figure had ever uh, crossed your desk and if you had any comments about uh, the balance that one really needs to achieve to get the desired effect on the local ecology through a native plant garden. Well, that's a million dollar question. Um, I, I have never heard the 80% thing personally, but that doesn't mean it's not, there's not some data backing that, mm -hmm. um, but it's never, no, it has not come across my desk. Um, I think it probably stands to reason that the more native diversity you have, the better for, for native pollinators and birds. But um, there, that's another issue. Excuse me. There's a, there's a pretty big um, lack. You know, there's not a ton of, um, there's, there's not a huge amount of research on this. And it's so specific to different geographies that like it might be 80% somewhere and much less than uh, much less than that elsewhere. What the number that we use for our target in like we, we hope to see this, and it's the threshold to be on our native plant garden tour is fifty percent. So we're hoping that fifty percent of the landscape will be native plants to to be on our tour. That's I don't know that that's based on any research or ecological data other than um, it's just sort of an an easy round number. You know we some I think like. There's the E.O. Wilson half earth thing that half of the earth kind of goes to wildlife and, and biodiversity, then that would be really a, a good uh, outcome. So that's, I think, part of that half earth idea. We, we, we would say that if half of the landscapes in urban California were native or half of the plants were native, we would be very happy. Um, and I have a UCLA scientist on, on my board who Likes to likes to really think deeply about that. You know, what would what would success look like? And and we sort of thought, you know, I'm fifty percent. Let's just let's put that out because we're so far away from that right now that we have plenty to go. And if we get to fifty percent, then we can talk about eighty percent. But um, I think what we see here is a lot of people who are interested in this just are one hundred. They're diehards and they're, they're never plant a non-native plant. And then we have others who um, who are you know really into cycads or um, orchids or who knows what they're into, but they, but they just, they still will come and have some native representation in their garden. And that's the approach that I try to come from is like, 
not everybody has to have a 100% native plant, but everybody should hopefully have a few native plants in their garden and dip your toe in the water and you might, you might like it more than you think. And once you get into it, um, cause it's a lot of fun and, um, but yeah, I've, I've not seen that 8% number. So I'm curious if you know, I'm, I'll look at pollinator posse, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Pollinator. Okay, I'll check them out. Thanks for that tip. Sure. They have like a stealth approach on native gardening. They're all about the pollinators. And then they slip it in of, oh, if you want these pollinators, you need to have a native garden. <laughs> it was yeah. nice. Well, yeah, there's a, I, I think there's a lot. She's there in the butterflies. Oh. And she's from Woodside. I think there's just more, uh, generally more awareness now about the pollinator connection than there was again, like previously, so. And I, I think it inspires people a little more like drought and saving money is is a good inspirational thing as well. And the bottom line is always important. But I think people really gravitate towards, you know, biodiversity. It's just something that's very tangible and obvious. And so it's I, I try to push it in our outreach as much as possible. Well, it makes your garden more interesting when you have little lizards to look at and bees and butterflies and hummingbirds and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I talk about that a lot too. And I think like, you know, you think, yeah, you think of, um, it's almost like when, when you have butterflies flying around or like a lizard, it's almost like, it's like a, a next level bloom of some sort. It's like, you've gotten like, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You've like bloomed on top of a blooming flower. You've bloomed this butterfly. Like, so it's, I think it's as just from a pure gardening perspective, it's like, man, look how successful I was. Like I've got this rare butterfly in my garden now. Um, so I think it's, I think it makes it much more interesting, but it's a reframing because some people, you know, seeing some kind of nondescript ish butterfly flying around is not going to be super exciting to them in the way that like a, a giant double rose would be really exciting. But I, I think that's a shift that that happens over time and it's generational and I think it's happening and there's room for all of it at the same time. Um, so, yeah. I wanna, uh, Beryl asked uh, about the involvement of Native American, uh, the Native American community. There's a couple of projects, one, one that I'm really excited about and I, it's been my very fun it's partially work, it's partially I also volunteer there because I just think it's really, it's a great community of people. There's a place called Kuravunga Springs. You can actually, I'll type it in the chat. You can Google it and read about it. Um, it's, this, it's an ancient sacred Tongva um, village site, Tongva were the indigenous uh, people of Los Angeles. And um, it's this, it's a really amazing like upwelling of water that's coming from the Santa Monica mountains. And so it's beautiful crystal clear water just like seeping up from the ground. It's a two acre property um, and they've been, it's been going through a lot of restoration in the last few years and we've been very involved in that. And every Saturday there's a volunteer event there. So we've donated plants and um, we try to help organize volunteers with, with that project. Um, but that's just wonderful because it's like, it's a site you can go visit. It's, there's a whole community of people there. People, same people kind of come back week after week. So, so you get to like, just have this kind of thriving community of people that's all oriented towards um, restoring this land and honoring the traditions that go with the land. So um, I think there's examples of, of projects like that probably in, in lots of other parts of the country, including where you guys are coming from. So I'd, I'd recommend just like learning about and researching that and, and getting involved. It's, it's very gratifying and fun work to be engaged in. Well, thank you, Evan. Um, we really appreciate you introducing us to the Theater Pain Foundation and uh, the garden tour in April. <laughs> yes, come down, it's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yes, Max, do a little road trip there. So anyway. Yeah, good time for a road trip. And come visit Theater Pain while you're down as well. And yeah, thank you guys for having me. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, so next month, if anybody wants to share, which we'd love to see all the uh, neat things uh, growing in you guys' gardens or, you know, anything really plant related would be great. 
Um, our next meeting is March 21st. Ken Blackford's back. So you're going to be continuing your um, what we missed last month about the uh, amaryllid, amaryllids, and then you're going to add some bulbs, right? Correct. Great. We look forward to seeing that. So um, Monday, March 21st. Bye, everybody.